Tia Weinberg uh, is the program coordinator of the patient support court at UCSF. She has participated in the patient support clubs for three years as an undergraduate student, intern from UC Berkeley. I work with Tia and Jeff Belcora on a DOD a grant, which we're gonna talk about here. Uh, it's a decision-making tool. There's lots of decision-making tools. This is UCF's, one of UCSF's decision-making tool. And then we'll, and then we'll have a little short presentation. Yeah. Three slides, mm -hmm. are they up there? They, no, okay, this is just the introductory slides. They're coming up. Next. Okay, and they're coming up. And, um, and then we're gonna go to our panel and talk about how these wonderful guys made their decisions and suggestions they have for other men making their decisions, so. Okay. Hi, everyone. There she go. Okay. So, I guess this is Stan's introduction. Let well, me get my to slides. my slides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. your, oh, you, right here. <laughs> um, so I hope you all can hear me. Uh, Thank you for the introduction. I am the program coordinator for the Patient Support Corps, and I work with Jeff Belcora, an adjunct faculty member at UCSF. And today what I'm going to show you is the framework that he designed um, for shared decision-making that we do use in our DOD study with men with prostate cancer. So this framework uh, was first developed for patients with breast cancer, and since it's been developed, we have expanded its use into a number of different conditions, including prostate cancer for use in decision making. And this framework is used to. No, I'm just wondering okay. if the panel could look. Yeah. So we don't have the monitors, <laughs> so. We just I'll, I'll also go verbally over some of this. Um, but this framework is to help you critically reflect on the decisions that you're making. So it's an acronym, it's called SCOPED. It stands for Situation, Choices, Objectives, People, Evaluation, and Decisions. And what I'm going to do today is walk you through how to build your own scope note. And I do want to emphasize that any of the information that you see on the following slides is based off of a fictionalized example. Um, so just be aware that any of the information may look different for each individual as you're filling this out for yourself, with your family, and with your care team. So the first section is situation, and this is clarifying known facts about your condition. In this section, you want to include any of the history, things like your diagnosis, any test results that you received or other reports, and anything that you've read or heard about your current condition. Um, in this scenario here, you can see that this is a 55-year-old male diagnosed with intermediate stage prostate cancer, and he does need to make a decision about his treatment options. The second category is choices, and this is clarifying which options are available to you. You want to include here any of the options that had been discussed or recommended by your care team, as well as any of the other options that you had heard about or read about as well. Um, so this could be from friends or family who may have gone through similar conditions, or also including things like clinical trials, complementary therapies that you want to have in these discussions. So for this patient, um, he was deciding between a radical prostatectomy or getting radiation therapy for his prostate cancer. Moving on to the next section is objectives, which is clarifying your goals and priorities. So this is really important for you to list all of your goals for the treatment, including both short-term and long-term goals. Um, it's your opportunity to list your thoughts and feelings and include any sorts of important dates or timelines that you want considered. So if you've got a vacation planned and you want to you know, rope that into your treatment timeline, you know, this is your opportunity to put that in there um, and also prioritize you know what is most important to you um, in terms of quality or of life in terms of you know after this treatment is over so in this example here um, you can see that this patient's uh, objectives and their goals were to cure their prostate cancer and to also maintain their sexual and urinary function Next category is people. So this is clarifying the roles and responsibilities of the people that will be involved. Here you want to include people that will be in your medical team. And again, that may not just be one person. That may be a variety of people that get involved. So making sure you know who those people are and their roles is important. Um, but as well, including any sorts of other family or friends that need to be involved. Um, and you know, including people like your support groups or other people that can support you throughout out this process too. 
So in this scenario, um, the patient listed himself, his wife, and his doctor as the main people that he wants to keep informed and involved throughout this process. The next section is evaluation. So this is clarifying how your choices affect your objectives. And this section is formatted a little bit differently um, because it's really organized to help you, you know, organize and prioritize, compare all of the information that you've been receiving in your conversations. So as you can see on the left-hand side, um, the different options that are available to you. And across the top are listed the goals that you deemed were important to you. It can also help in terms of organization to highlight things that we call information sweet spots. So they may highlight areas where you need to go back and gather additional information. So if you look up at the top, um, in regards to curing his prostate cancer, um, the radical prostatectomy is considered very effective for long-term survival. And this may be an area where you wanna go back to your doctor and figure out, you know, what the length of that means or some specific statistics. And that is completely fine. We want you to use this process throughout your conversations in order to help you refine your decision making. Um, another thing that I want to point out is that Jeff and I are using this in our DOD trial. Um, and we work with men diagnosed with low risk prostate cancer there where we present to them their personalized risk information. So um, just to show you that you know this kind of framework and process can help you capture both quantitative and qualitative information. And the last section that I have here is decision. So this is clarifying which choice is best and the next steps from there. So in this example, the patient made an informed decision to go ahead with radical prostatectomy, and the next steps being that he needs to inform his doctor and get this procedure scheduled. For every person that's completing their own scope note, you know, this decision might look a little bit different for you, and I know many of you are in different timelines, perhaps, in your care. Um, so that decision may be, hey, I need to get another test and wait for the results. Let's evaluate from there. Or I'm going to move forward with one treatment and we'll continue evaluating to see if there's additional treatment needed further down the line. So this can change, but we want you to have this as a reminder. And that overall is the process of building your own scope note. Um, just so everyone knows, the examples that I showed here, very simple, but this example case is printed as a handout in the materials that you receive today. So you could take a look at it, remind yourself what goes in each category. And on the flip side of this handout is a blank scope note so that you can take all the information that you've read about, received, and have gotten from the specialist today um, and incorporate that into a note that you work on and share with your friends and families and your medical team um, so that you can make the best decision for you at the time right now. You have a slide on that, don't you? Can you show them so they'll know what you recognize? Do you have a slide? Oh, I don't have a slide with the whole oh, okay. one. Um, oh. Yes, but it is in your, it, it is handout. a handout Everybody. in your folder. Um, and so like I said, we, we're doing this uh, with our multi-site trial um, where we're working and displaying this information for men with prostate cancer. Uh, we have health coaches that walk them through this process over the phone and then help them get the scope note so they can refer to it during their appointments. And through our work in the patient support core, we also train patient scribes um, who, in addition to coaching patients over the phone, can also accompany them at UCSF to their appointments and write up a summary of the information that they received at that time. And just as a final note, if you are interested in more information about Scoped, you can refer to Jeff's book, Deal, Discovery, Learning, um, sorry, Discovery, Engagement, and Leverage for Professionals, uh, which is a book available on Amazon. Uh, Jeff's email is included in that handout that everyone has, and I will also be around for a few minutes afterwards if anybody has questions they, they want to ask me. Thank you. So Thank you. you can, uh, over there if you All right. Um, so now my slides. Okay, they're here. They should be here. All right. So um, now we're our panel. And uh, let me just do a little, a few introductions so you know who's who. Joe Ferrara right here, am I right? Okay, is a professional musician. 
And I've heard you saying the uh, Star Spangled Banner at the Oakland. Was no, it Oakland? San Francisco. Yeah, uh, San Francisco, right. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Giants boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Joe, Joe is, of course, a board member of the California Prostate Cancer Coalition. I think we mentioned that before. He's a 14-year prostate cancer survivor. He's a member of the steering committee of the Santa Cruz County Prostate Cancer Support Group. Um, and this is a really interesting thing. So Joe's business is a comic book business. And Joe went and negotiated with Marvel Comics to put out a series of comics with a PSA, a public service announcement about PSA. Oh. <laughs> right? Unfortunately, uh, it was during the recommendation D, and so they didn't really push it. But uh, two years ago, we went to another company, and they put a full-page PSA in a uh, quarter million comics. So much, show. That's great an accomplishment. So, Dick. Okay, Dick is one of the movers and shakers in the Marin support group, my support group. Uh, it's, well, I, I moderate it, but everybody, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a team effort, the group. Uh, Dick has worked in healthcare, environmental restoration, and high tech. And Dick is a member of the UCSF uh, prostate cancer uh, support group. So, um, and Walt. On the right, okay, uh, also a member of the Marin Support Group, um, and he maintains our database, which is no mean job to do. We have 400, no, how many now? Yeah, a lot, oh, yeah, a lot of members. All right, um, and um, so it makes sense that Walt spent the last 30 years as an international trade finance specialist, database, and all that, in my mind, goes together. Um, and also as a member of the UCSF Patient Service Committee. Okay, having said that, all right, the panelists will take a minute or two to introduce the facts of their diagnosis. We'll just go here, start with Joe, okay? And then tell us how they went about making their treatment decision. So we've got to remember three things. And then third, tell us what they learned about decision making that might enable them to do a better or a different job if they had to do it again. Can you go there, Joe? Sure, Jen. Um, I'm, I'm a classic baby boomer. I was 55 and I did not know a damn thing about this. When the doctor, actually it wasn't a doctor, it was uh, two friends of mine, uh, seven days apart, told me the same thing. Uh, I asked a buddy, how are you doing? He says, I thought I was fine. And a doctor just told me I had prostate cancer and I got no symptoms. And a week later, a second person told me the same exact thing. And I stood there and said, well, I got no symptoms. I feel pretty good, maybe I should get checked. And I went to my, my GP, young woman, who looked at my PSA and said, well, your PSA went, was rising. It went from two to three to four over two years, and I didn't know what a PSA was at 55. And uh, she did not do a DRE. And I don't know why I said, well, I wanna get checked anyway. I didn't even know what I was asking about. She sent me to the urologist, did the ultrasound in those days, no MRIs, and uh, I heard that famous phrase, this is a suspicious looking area. <laughs> and uh, I was told I had a Gleason 6. One of my two friends is no longer with us. The other one, uh, when I told him the next time I saw him, I said, well, I've got it too. And he immediately said, well, the guy you want to see is Peter Carroll. Because his wife had had uh, some cancer and uh, he was really um, appreciative of the way that she was treated here. That's the first time I heard that name. So uh, two days later, my sister called me and said, the guy you want to see is Peter Carroll. And one of the few times in my life I was able to say, I beat you to it. <laughs> and uh, so I came up here, had a great team, saw Shinohara, saw Peter, saw many people up here. That was where I got the team approach. Uh, my local doctor didn't mind giving me the referral at all, which was great. Uh, he's still my local urologist. Um, and when I was presented with all the options, the other thing that occurs to me and I, I can talk to this a, a little bit later, is I was also blessed with limited information. How many of us have seen guys walk into our support groups? They haven't even had uh, uh, the, the results of their biopsy yet, and they can tell you every side effect of every damn treatment that's in the book <laughs> or on the internet. And it paralyzes them, choice paralyzation. 
Uh, we really need to help men make these choices. Stuff like this is great, but the more items on the menu, the harder it is for some men to make this choice. So I talked to Peter Carroll and I said, I understand that uh, radiation and s surgery have the same success ratio percentage, which again, it's mortality rate we're talking about. We're not talking about quality of life. When they say five years later, 90% of the men are still alive. That's how they measure it. And I asked, well, what about quality of life? And they didn't have anything to measure that. And I said, hmm, I don't like that. But I said, what are, what are the side effects? What are the downsides if they both have the same successful outcome? And he said, uh, well, usually the side effects from radiation uh, involved some kind of bowel dysfunction, and usually the surgical side effects usually involved urinary or sexual dysfunction. And my first thought was, well, they have a pill for the front end, but they don't have one for the back end. <laughs> I'm serious. This was my thought process. So my wife and I both agreed. And some guys, I'm one of those guys, you know, some guys take the car in. We had a referral earlier to how much care we take when we're buying a car. But, you know, we trust our mechanic. He says, you need brakes, you need this or that. Um, some guys do maintenance regularly. Other guys wait for the light to come on on the dashboard. And I, I'm one of those guys. But the minute I heard that I had a cancer, my wife and I discussed this. And the, 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 the factor that made me decide surgery was, look, I've got this cancer in me. Nobody knows what turns on a cancer cell. <clears throat> I want it out. General Schwarzkopf, I just want it out. And after we got it out, the pathology said that my Gleason 6 was really a Gleason 7. And uh, I've had no side effects uh, other than uh, getting old and having a weak stream. You see the line of guys this morning trying to use the can? <laughs> Holy mackerel. I'm going to be waiting all day just for those guys to get in and out of there. Uh, I've, I've had no erectile dysfunction uh, and nothing else to speak of. I, I have to occasionally use a pad, but that's not a big deal. Um, and what, what would I choose today? I, I'm kind of glad I didn't have more options, but I still think the clarity of speaking with my wife, we've talked about having a, a caregiver and a support person, and um, the conclusion we came to relatively easily after all of that input was that we would deal with the surgery and then whatever happened would happen. We weren't going to beat ourselves up over the, over the possible side effects. So it didn't paralyze us into not doing anything which we've seen happen. So um, in retrospect, I probably would have done the same thing. But I will say this, I probably would have been a very good candidate for active surveillance. Mm -hmm. Whether or not I would have gone on it is a good question because at that time, if that's what the experts were telling me to do, I probably would have done that, and it probably would have given me more time. But I, I, this was April, I had surgery in September. So the one thing different was I probably would have been on active surveillance for a period of time, but then I would have still chosen surgery. Thank you, Joe, so much. Mm -hmm. Dick, you know the exercise. <laughs> uh, this will probably sound a little more orderly than it actually proceeded. I was diagnosed with a four plus five Gleason nine cancer. That was after a few other events that happened in my life. So my first stage was shock, and I think that's something that most people here can identify with. That's a really bad place to make an important decision, and this is a fateful decision because it affects the rest of your life. So the first good thing that I did, excuse me, is that working better? Sorry. Yeah. Try and speak up. Yell if I don't. Uh, the first good thing that I did was to have the presence to ask how much time do I have to make this decision. So that turned out to be about five or six months in the opinion of the surgeon who did my biopsy. And I used that time to take a, a kind of account of my situations is what I call it. So my situations were not only that I needed to understand the risks inherent in that kind of a diagnosis, which I didn't understand, I needed to understand I had just been diagnosed with another disease in the prior few months that had a shorter time to death. <laughs> so I had that and one other disease. I had good sexual function at the time, 61 uh, age, and fairly young in a relationship, a long-term relationship. So those were some of my situations that I had to take good account of and good understanding. So the second phase that I went to was confusion, okay? So there's a lot going on here and I need to sort that out and develop some kind of hypothesis for myself about how I want to approach this. So 
that involved understanding what my personal values were and making some trade-off decisions. What really helped me here was that I had the privilege to help both of my parents and a few other people work through their final stages of life. So I was not unfamiliar with the concept of trade-offs and how those take a little while to sort out. It's not obvious initially what the answer is going to be. But values and talking with my partner about this, having her there at all the consults so that we could talk about it, recording the consults and listening to them at the gym afterwards <coughs> as I was doing my regular workouts, another part of the complementary solution, but not the curative solution, if you will. Mm -hmm. So that led me to a hypothesis. And that was the hardest thing to get to. For me, it was, I want to apply the 80-20 rule here. I don't want to try and cure this kind of cancer because I think the side effects of going for the cure are going to be very difficult for me. And I don't know if I'm going to live that long, given some of my other conditions, to get the benefits. So I said, OK, I'm going to knock out like 80% of it. I found the most experienced focal therapy guy in Haifu who you know, he proctored the FDA trials for that in the United States and was doing it for years offshore beforehand. He treated that cancer. And then I said, I'm going to use that time to see if I can get these other conditions under control. If so, I certainly don't want the cancer to have run away because that would steal from me the benefits that I'm trying for as I'm working on those other conditions. So got that hypothesis worked out. And then the last stage was to go from this hypothesis into actually making it work. Gather evidence, set up some little controlled trials or tests. Can I test this hypothesis? Can I find that kind of doctor? Is there some evidence? What does he say about the outcomes that he's produced so far? Can I talk to other patients who have been treated in such a manner? And can I just spend some time with Rhonda talking this through and knowing that this is something that we're committed to as a couple because it affects her too, okay? So that was how I worked it through. Um, the last part that I haven't articulated was that UCSF does my follow-up. I did not go back to that doctor. My strategy was you're expert at treating, that's what I'm gonna have you do but my follow-up is all done here by people who are doing that on thousands of other guys. So I'm in effectively active surveillance here at UCSF. End of story. And, and just quickly, and well, quickly as long as you want to take, any changes in retrospect now that that was a couple of years ago? Anything you change in the process you went through? Evidence, evidence, <laughs> evidence. Um, there is a great deal more available now, I think, than there was before. Um, through working in the Marin Prostate Cancer Information Group, I've gotten more familiar with how to evaluate evidence. It is an uncertain practice and discipline because I do not want to try and be a doctor. But there is an ill-defined role for a patient in his own decision making and informed decision making that we're trying in the group to refine to a little bit more of an evidence-based decision. So by the debate back and forth that is predicated not on I've got the right answer and I'm telling you what it is, but here's what I'm thinking of doing, let's talk about it. That has been really productive and I would encourage everyone who's making a decision to debate that with their peers in a group such as ours. Thank you so much. Walt Trask. Thank you. Yeah, so my story is um, similar to Dick's and to, um, I'm sorry, Joe. Joe's, thank you, in that um, I shared the shock and bewilderment when I was diagnosed. I had been seeing a doctor, a primary care physician, who was of the belief that PSA testing really had no benefit. And I, I went with that bias. Um, I'd see him every year, and I would walk out of his office fat, dumb, and happy. Um, and I finally pushed to get a PSA test. I, my Gleason, I'm sorry, my um, PSA was 8.6 at the time. It had more than quadrupled since the last time I had taken a test. So I 
uh, it resulted that I had intermediate risk uh, prostate cancer. It was on the cusp of being high risk. In fact, they treated me as if I had high risk cancer. I had a prostatectomy. This is 2015. I had a prostatectomy. I had um, radiation therapy and uh, almost two years of ADT. I'm probably the poster guy up here for side effects. I won't go through the litany, but I've had enough uh, to share among you if you'd like some. <laughs> Joking. Um, and I think um, my decision making was sort of, um, it was pretty fast actually. I was so bewildered by the delayed diagnosis and Dr. Shinohara, I was treated at UCSF, UCSF. Dr. Shinohara said I had about a three month period to uh, get my prostate out before, and my disease was throughout the, the prostate gland, um, four plus three, Gleason. So um, I decided to get a radical prostatectomy right away and, and went through everything else. So I, I really didn't have a lot of time and I really think I had enough time to sort of do anything else. And for me, surgery was where I wanted to go. I wanted it out and, and, and I did that. Um, looking back, um, would I do anything different? Yes, I would do something different and um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't deny so much. I think I was going through a denial process. I had an uncle that died of prostate cancer. His father, my grandfather, had prostate cancer, didn't die of it. I think in the back of my little head, I was thinking that there's a possibility, but this doctor I'm seeing is saying, no, don't worry about it. And I just went with that bias, which turned out to be the wrong decision. Um, and what's the last question? Um, no, that was, that was it, all right. Oh, thank, thank you so much. So um, thank you everybody, but don't go away. Don't go away, you can clap. Yes, you. Okay, Eric, your question. Of course. Um, I, I couldn't contain myself, even though I'm not formally part of the session. First of all, I'd like to thank the three of you uh, for sharing. Um, and, and to paraphrase my friend Mike Rabo, to allowing us to bear witness. I mean, it, this is, thank you. Um, I, the comment I want to make, and Stan and I had these discussions, is that although there was a sense of pressure, um, in general for earlier stage prostate cancer, you can take your time, some of you did. Um, and that's, that's a really important piece of advice to, to stop, think, contemplate all of your options, go through this process that you heard about, which takes time. Um, I want to make sure, and I don't know how many men in this audience um, have, have faced decision making with more advanced disease. I know, I know there are people in the audience that have, because I know you. Um, and it's a different situation when you have metastatic disease and you've been treated with hormones and the PSA is climbing. You don't have the luxury of time to do this. You certainly don't feel like you have the luxury of time. And I, and I want to offer some, some thoughts on it, very brief thoughts. My recommendation is after that information has been absorbed is to ask your physician three questions. And they actually are very similar to the questions that you asked. One is, what are my options here? Right. You're telling me I should go on abiraterone. What are my options? And uh, if you're seeing an experienced physician, they will have already given you a whole bunch of options. But what are my options? Number one. Number two, I really endorse this, this comment on evidence. So what are my options? What is the evidence behind each one of those options? Because then you can put it into this decision-making model, but quickly. And then the last question that I love getting, um, and if I don't get it, I'll answer anyway. <laughs> is, are there other questions that I should be asking? Because you're in this seat, you don't know what the hell to think. Um, and uh, I think asking your physician that question gets them out of the mode of, well, this is what you have to do, of course. Uh, what you want is a sort of a, a balanced discussion of those other questions. The questions as a physician that don't help me that much or that I don't think I can answer very well are, well, what would you do, doc? Because our circumstances will, aren't the same, but 
it is fair to say, well, given these options, you know, what's what what are what are my other options? So I just I just want to make sure that we acknowledge that this, the decision making process that was taken by these three courageous men um, is manifest in different ways for different people and definitely is dependent on your stage of your disease. But just because you have hormone resistant prostate cancer with liver metastases doesn't mean that you don't get to go through the same process and that you don't have the right to consider options. And so what is not an okay outcome is that your doctor tells you this is what you're gonna do, which unfortunately happens a little bit more, I think, in advanced disease. Uh, in earlier stage disease, through work like so. support groups, there's been this incredible work where patients are empowered. Patients should be empowered at every stage of the disease. So I just want to ask you a question. question. Well, sure. Said. So what we've sometimes heard in the group for a man who's more in that position is that they could ask their doctor for a short-term shot of ADT just to give them time, although their disease is advanced, it would give them a little break in order to go through an informed sure. decision-making process. Sure, that's a, if, if they're in a, in a if one is in a position, position to do that, absolutely, that's a reasonable right. thing. The other, the other concept uh, that I've learned, you know, we, <laughs> we place so much value on um, patient empowerment and patient decision-making which is absolutely well-founded, that we sometimes forget that, that sometimes a patient really needs to hear from a doc, not what would you doc, do, doc, but what is your opinion? What is your considered opinion? And this was really brought home to me. You know, in, in the Bay Area, we take care of, um, there, there's lots of sort of very unique demographics. So we take people, take care of, Surfers, we take care from Santa Cruz. We are musicians. We we take care of you know sedentary. <laughs> we we take care of uh, you know wine uh, you know, grape growers, um, you know high tech people from Silicon Valley. But one of the groups that we we take care of is um, United Airlines has a hub in San Francisco, and so we see a lot of a reasonable amount of pilots. And one of my patients told me in a very poignant way. And it, it really drove it home. When I was, it was relatively early in my career and I was talking about, you know, the decision really is yours. And he looked at me and said, Eric, you know, if I'm flying you into O'Hare, <laughs> you see where I'm going, right? In the middle of winter, the runways are icy and there's a 50 mile an hour crosswind, you want me flying that plane. Trust me, you want me flying that plane, and it sort of like hit me like a you know like a plane, <laughs> you know like oh yeah, duh, of course. And so there's this fine balance, and so it's your job, our jobs as patients and physicians, but it's your job as a patient when you're talking to your doc to sort of make clear where you're coming from, and if if you are in a position where you do not feel comfortable making that decision to say so. To say, listen, I'm, I'm really feeling overwhelmed here. What are my options? What is the evidence? Are there other questions I should ask? Or if you're in another position, you can say, thanks doc for the options, I'm gonna go figure it out. That's fine, but it's up to you. I mean, your job in the relationship with the doc is to communicate your position. And I guess that sort of is in that model that we heard about. Um, I, I just, I just want to make sure that we, you know, while, while time is precious and it's really important for making decisions, and by the way, there's never a situation, I, I love telling patients, you know, prostate cancer, even in, in its most aggressive form, in its most advanced state, is not leukemia that had to be treated yesterday. So we do have that luxury of time. but. But I, I just want people to feel that it's not always possible to take the three to six to 12 months, uh, which is a gift. So thanks. But, but there's still a decision making process. Absolutely. <laughs> still, can I add something? Yes. Um, thank you, doctor. Um, 
we come across this so much, and I'll be brief with this. Um, when my wife had a subsequent diagnosis of breast cancer, the first meeting she had was an hour and a half with a nurse navigator who had a binder. Here's a picture of your cancer. This is what it looks like. Here's what we're going to do. Unless the handheld for an hour and a half. I was told, here's the brochure. Thank you. Nanette, what she does is, is absolutely essential. And many men in, in their communities do not have the opportunity to be that forthright. Many men cannot be, as Eric said. We've got to talk about the man as a whole person. And men, by their nature, many men are not going to be forthcoming enough to say that. I agree with you wholeheartedly, but it's the biggest hurdle we have in our support group. We need somebody to help those men navigate those waters, a nurse navigator, some medical professional. Most of us, none of us in our, our support group are medical professionals. So we always predicate that at the beginning of the meeting. This is anecdotal. We're not pros. Uh, you want a guy who wants to fly the plane. Exactly. Uh, so I think that along with all the other stuff we talked about with the health care in this country and everything, every community needs to have a man have opportunities to have a nurse navigator or a nurse practitioner, and it's not always immediately available, and they don't know how to get to it. Those of us who are here today know how to get to it. There's a lot of guys back home that don't. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Dick. One of the other lessons that was important for me was to explore above and below the option that you're naturally biased to at the outset. So everybody knows, oh, I think it should be that. OK, but go for a consultation with those doctors, at least two. And then the next more aggressive therapy, go to a couple of consults on that and maybe the one that's a little less aggressive below that. The purpose here is to learn in order to make an informed decision. And that's how you learn, is I went to doctors, I thought, I'm not gonna go to this person, but we walked out saying, well, we have a lot to talk about. Everything that got said, that was real. I wasn't expecting to hear that. Listen to the tape again. You know, you do it on your iPhone. Nobody turned us down in our request to do that, and I really recommend it. Because when I listened to it later, I heard so much that I didn't remember. He said that? I, I didn't remember, you know? So anyway. <laughs> Well said, Dick, thank you. Okay, we're wrapping it up. So I have, I'm just gonna finish with two questions. I know it's late, but one of them is, one of them I can answer. Did Mr. Riddington do the haifu? Yes, you did the haifu. I did. You had the haifu. Okay. Yes, I'm three years just, out. I just had my third year uh, examination under Dr. Shinohara here. And, you know, might I relapse? The numbers say yes, you might. Yes, they are not favorable. But will I regret it? No, it has been a good decision for me. And part of it is accepting the responsibility of those risks mm -hmm. and in preparing a plan B in my head, which mm -hmm. is why I stay mm -hmm. close in and stay in involved. Thank you, Dick. Okay, this is the last question. This is really important to me and I think to everybody. Here's the question. It's for, it's for Tia, but anybody can chime in, okay? Here's the statement. The objectives of curing, the objectives of curing prostate cancer and maintaining urinary function and sexual function appear to be mutually exclusive. <coughs> Please comment. Are they mutually exclusive? Absolutely not. So, um, based off of the example, I mean, curing the prostate cancer it could look in like different ways. Um, you know, it can be alleviating symptoms. It could be in terms of like the outlook, how many years you're expecting. Um, you know, that's all things that should be considered. So, you know, if curing your prostate mean, prostate cancer means like for you, you're not gonna have these other like urinary or sexual problems in the future, like those don't have to be mutually exclusive. Those should be, all be considered in the conversation. Right.